Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. 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 Are we good? Yeah. Okay. So I called a meeting. I called an order. Uh, February 22nd, 2023, revised budget hearing and regular board meeting pursuant to Idaho Code sections 33506 and 33510. Can the clerk determine if a quorum is present? There are four trustees in attendance. The quorum is present. Thank you. And so we move on to approval of the agenda, and there is nothing to add to the agenda, so, so we're good there. Moving on to approval of the minutes. I will move that the Board of Trustees of Moscow School District Number 281 approve the minutes for the special board meeting for executive session January 25th, 2023, annual meeting and regular board meeting January 25th, 2023, special board meeting and executive session February 9th, 2023, special board meeting and executive session February 15th, 2023, and special board meeting and executive session February 16th, 2023. I'll second been moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Passes 4-0. So now we move on to the 2022-23 proposed revised budget. Jennifer Johnson. Now can I go since it's not 7-10 yet? Oh yes. Yeah. We can't go till 7-10? Oh wow. Well. So then we'll skip it and just move mm. on and to the other things and we'll come back to you. Like good news or I didn't realize it said 7-10 but... If you would like, you could skip all the way. Does to it say seven? Zoom. Mine says seven. But it seven was ten. advertised as seven ten. Oh, okay. to start. Yes. All right. So, we all right. Move so on. we'll move on to good news announcements and presentations, and we'll come back to that when it's seven ten. So congratulations to the following Moscow High School students who were presented with the Monthly Student Recognition Award, Positive Attitude, and Outstanding Effort in Class. So ninth grade was Alana Kamanati and Nicholas Rudlicka. Tenth grade was Maggie Abrams and Kiernan Thurston. Eleventh grade was Addie Brand and Joey Williams. And twelfth grade was Owen Allinger and Christopher Smith. Congratulations to Kieran Hillier McVeigh, Moscow High School student, uh, Moscow High School 11th grader, who is traveling to Bellevue, Washington this week to play violin in the All Northwest Honor Orchestra. Kieran is the only violinist in Region 2 to be accepted for this honor. On February 11, at the Lecomte Auditorium, Mayor Art Fetage. Um, presented framed certificates and book people gifts cards to the winners of the 2023 Martin Luther King Jr. Art and Essay Contest, sponsored by the Latah County Human Rights Task Force. The theme of the contest was the value of community. Included in the presentation were winners for Moscow School District, uh, Danny Roberts and Maxwell Talbot, Talbot Williams from Lena Whitmore Elementary, Coco Harlow and Linus Wanamaker from Moscow Middle School, Justin Reeves, Justine Reeves, and Lily Hume from Paradise Creek Regional High School. Right. Moscow Middle School 7th grade social studies students created original children's books on the subject of Europe. Students were selected by their peers to travel to Moscow Elementary Schools this past week to read and share their stories in the classrooms. The students who were selected to share include Rose Becker, Catherine Cummings, Eloise Hanish, Logan Newell, Hannah Alabunmi, Claire Pfeiffer, Maria, Mariah Tompkins, Mabel Vaughn, Linus Wanamaker, Becca Warren, Mia Wentz, Izzy Allison, Mason Atterbury Marzolf, Isiana Baker, Caleb Dudley, Keith Gulbertson, Ella Hansen, Meredith Moberly, Mia Modad, Mark Perryman, Nathan Poehler, and Gemma Sorensen. Okay, so great. Congratulations to all the students. Is there any other good news? No. Oh. Okay. But that was quite a bit right there. All right, so we will move on to our first public comment period. 
Public comments is a time to present concerns, issues, and information to the Board of Trustees. The Board hears your comments but does not answer questions or respond at this time, but may ask the superintendent or designee to respond to the issue presented if further action is warranted. Please state your name for the record. Please limit your comments to no more than three minutes. And the reason we do not take questions or respond is it is not an agenda item and we can only discuss what's on the agenda. Are there any public comments? Okay. If you go to the podium and uh, state your name. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mary Ellen Brewick, and I have children at Lena Whitmore and also the Moscow Middle School. Um, a few things on my mind this evening because um, I'm very happy to be here. But um, thank you to the middle school and the principal there for the core program. My sixth grader has really enjoyed that. I really appreciated the information about the weekly 30 minute um, activities, exercise curriculum around kindness. I think this week is diversity and that um, really has resonated very well with me and I'm glad my child gets to do that. Um, I also appreciate all the um, work that went into responding to the threat um, at the high school and the middle um, and then for the whole district and I think I just appreciate all that was put into it and all the planning beforehand and the adjustments and certainly there's room for changes and improvements like always but I feel like um, I'm glad my kids go to school here in Moscow. Um, and then I am still very, 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 very concerned about the air conditioning and the smoke and the heat at Lena Whitmore. Um, I, again, truly feel like it is a safety issue. We are, if not already, closely soon to be at emergency situations. Um, those classrooms are 90 plus degrees starting at nine or 10 in the morning. And none of us in this room would spend eight hours in a 90 degree space expecting our brains to work and learn. And I really ask and implore you to find even a short term solution to this problem. Um, it, it means a lot. Um, some discussion among other parents at Lena Whitmore has been what about heat pumps that could be um, several rooms, maybe take less energy. I appreciate that the grids are, the energy grids are hard um, to uh, to address and they're old buildings and we, I feel like we get it and we also think there must be a solution. So I would also ask for it to be added to a future agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so. We move on to superintendent's report. We have about three minutes till the budget hearing. I would recommend you just, just wait. Away. That's what I was about to say. We can we can wait for three minutes and, and do the budget hearing. Mm -hmm. We'll just you'll barely get started and then we'll yeah. have to shut you off. So yeah, now it's two minutes. Now it's two minutes. Yeah, if I just keep talking. We'll be there, right? <laughs> I would think you probably can get started. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's close enough, and it will take a minute for her to get into the depth of it. So, all right. So, Jennifer Johnson. Okay. Well, welcome everyone to the revised budget hearing for fiscal year twenty-two twenty-three. Okay. I'm getting the. Hold on. See. I told it's going to take a couple <laughs> minutes for Greg yeah. to get ready. <laughs> well, perfect. There you go. Okay, so why we revise the budget. During the original budget planning process, we oftentimes don't have the exact information we need to project revenues and expenses. The first reporting period in November is used to calculate average daily attendance, which then generates support units to determine following or funding for salary-based apportionment. Our discretionary and entitlement dollars are based on the best 28 weeks, a number we do not possess in February. It has been our practice to use 97% of last year's best 28 weeks when setting the original budget. However, for the first time in several years, we decided to use our best 28 weeks full support units when setting the original budget for 22-23. Keep in mind, support units are based on enrollment now, and that's why we made that decision. Um, when revising, I, I do look at what November and December support units are and base the revised budget on these numbers. So our original budget support units were 108.58. 
And then our revised budget support units were coming in at 108.95, and that's without protection. Um, we don't know what the protection number is because it's not known at the time that I set the revised budget. Enrollment was up by 37 students year over year. And then also most federal allocations are not finalized until October, and most grants tend to be awarded in the fall of any given fiscal year. Talking about fund balance, during the original budget process, fund balance is only a projection. The audit is finalized in October, so we have an actual fund balance number to build into our revised budget. So um, fund balance was projected at $4.9 million, and it came in just over $4.9 million. Mid-year evaluation of expenses and revenues is very important. We analyze our revenues and expenses at this midpoint and adjust for any unforeseen revenues and or expenses as com compared to the original budget projections. We are in the third year of our COVID allocations and we are constantly assessing what is needed, paying close attention to the restrictions and guidelines set by the federal government. And for all those reasons just stated is why we choose to revise mid-year. Next slide, please. The legal ad was published on February 11th, 2023 per Idaho Code 33801. I did include a separate document in Board Docs for your review because this one is super hard to read on the screen. So um, this publication compares our original budget to our revised budget. And then the first section is general fund. And then the section on your right would be the all other funds. Next slide. This presentation is comparing our original budget to the proposed, proposed revised budget. So let's first start talking about the general fund and we'll begin with revenue adjustments. For the original budget, we did set the support units at 108.58, which is based on the best 28 weeks enrollment ADA for 21-22. As of December 2022, our numbers were at 108.95. They are also based on enrollment average daily attendance for the third year in a row. This is a temporary ruling set by the State Board of Education, I believe. The State Department uses the December numbers to generate our February payment. As I stated earlier, the fund balance revised number came in just a bit higher than what was projected. And our state revenue increased by $82,073. The main increase is due to how literacy funding is now calculated, and we also had a slight increase to our um, IDLA funding. Uh, next slide, please. So, on to our revised expense adjust adjustments, and I've just kind of listed um, the ones that I find most important and that stand out and have the, some of the highest costs. A 4% pay increase was allocated to all staff for 22-23. We also paid steps and columns for certified and longevity for classified. We also accounted for the 1% increase from 21-22. There was a 0% increase to the district contribution for health care. Regents did increase our insurance premiums by 3%. The state allocated a one-time additional compensation to instructional and pupil services staff only. And so the board approved the same compensation for classified staff. An assistant activity supervisor and an assistant nurse were approved. They were hired at the um, end of 21-22, and so their full year cost was built into the, to the budget. An extra day and a rate increase for all paraprofessionals was also implemented. Next slide, please. Um, let's see. And then many leadership stipends were also continued but paid by the district as well as Title II monies. Our utility costs will see varying increases ranging from 2.25% to 5% depending on the service provided. Our security system budget has increased to account for replacement cost and software upgrades. And our transportation budget has been increased mainly due to the high cost of fuel. Contracting busing has also seen a significant increase. I had listed uh, 40 to 55 percent inflation. I meant to put 140 to 155 percent inflation. Mm -hmm. um, in some cases, the budgets have more than doubled. Mm 
Um, and then in addition, bus driver pay was reviewed and increased as well. Next slide, please. And expense adjustments continued. Fund transfers, we have increased our Medicaid match payment as well as our transfer to plant facilities for unforeseen asbestos and tractor purchase. Our maintenance of effort has been increased by $244,000 $244, when comparing original to revised budgets. And then our Medicaid match has increased by $131,000 due to an increased number of special education services provided. We are required to pay a match amount of approximately 23% of what we are reimbursed by Health and Welfare. Most of our contracted services are Medicaid reimbursable at 98%. Next slide, please. The Medicaid administrative fee cannot be paid using Medicaid funds, nor can it be paid by from the maintenance of effort in the general fund. That said, the expense has been coded to the general fund business operations budgets. That approximate cost is $50,000, a 10% or a $10,000 increase over original budget number. We expected to hire an educational technology specialist, but that was postponed to 23-24. Workman's compensation will incur a $17,000 increase over what was originally projected, and the board approved an increase to the certified substitute rate pay of 90, it went from $95 per day to $110 per day. Next slide, please. Are there any questions regarding the general fund? There's a lot of information, but if not, I'll continue on to all other funds. The public can ask questions too, just so you know, if you do come up with it. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> um, Jennifer, yeah. as the newest person, would you mind explaining to me the the various percentages you were discussing with the Medicaid reimbursement? Like, let's say that it's a $100 fee. Could you explain <laughs> to me, like, what we pay, what we get reimbursed, what we have to contribute? So any contracted services that we provide to our special education students, um, some of those qualify for Medicaid reimbursement. So most of those that are coded to the Medicaid fund are at 98% reimbursable. Of that reimbursed amount, we are required to pay 23% of that as a match. Um, and that, that rate can go up or down. Uh, we saw it go down a little bit during COVID. They gave cut us a break. Um, so I do project that it will go up at some point. And so there's a, a whole calculation that I work through and um, we've developed that with our auditors as well to kind of determine what we budget and what our match is in the 260 fund, which is our Medicaid fund. Um, all of that has to play with the calculation of maintenance of effort, which is sits in the general fund and also has to play with title um, IDEA title uh, 257 funds, which are our special allocation from the federal government. So between all three of those, it's a constant movement of meeting your maintenance of effort versus what you are being reimbursed for the services that are Medicaid reimbursable versus what we get from the federal government. And keeping in mind, we have to spend down that money. We cannot carry over a certain amount. So in the summertime, there's a lot of um, different calculations that we go through. Okay. So I hope that answers your question. There are many pieces to the special education piece. I might follow up with you yes. to get a, a if I could and a more out. elaborate. Uh -huh. <laughs> it might make a we little more a sense to you. Or something. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Okay. If there are no further questions. I'll move on to all other funds. So the points of interest that I've uh, mapped out, um, we start with, I have included carryover in the balances listed on the next few slides. You'll see a comparison of um, original budget to revise shortly on a, a spreadsheet looking like form. The 230 fund, which is our local special projects, has many new Moscow Education Foundation grants as well as local grants and donations. The 234 fund, for activities has also increased. Projections for game attendance, season passes, and activity fees for each sport have, have increased for the most part. Fund 243, which is our Career Technical Education Fund, received a one-time grant for equipment. And then Fund 250, our ARP Homeless 2 total is $9,268. 
I did miss including this in the budget, so my apologies. <clears throat> Points of interest continued. Title I will receive an interfund transfer from Title II to help fund all expenses for a third year. Fund 257, IDEA school age, has decreased slightly due to spending down a larger amount <coughs> of the carryover from prior year. Our <coughs> Medicaid fund will see a significant increase due to new contracted services provided to, to students for 22-23. Title funds 261 and 271 both had dollars left to spend from 21-22. And plant facilities will see an increase mainly due to our two buses in fiscal year 21-22 not arriving prior to the end of the school for the fiscal year. Okay, talking a oh next slide. Yep. Okay. Talking a little bit about our COVID funds, we do currently have six federal COVID funds set in our budget per state IFARMS accounting structure that are one-time monies with restrictive guidelines and timelines for spending. So fund 250 is our ARP homeless $2. Fund 252 accounts for the CARES Act ESSER $1. Inside this fund, there are three pots of money, flow through, social emotional learning, and learning management system. These funds have been fully expended as of 9-30-22. Fund 253 accounts for the CRRSA Act, ESSER $2. Fund 254 accounts for the ARP ESSER $3, which is divided into two pots, discretionary and learning loss. Fund 259 accounts for IDEA, ARPA, school age and preschool special education dollars. And Fund 288 accounts for the Idaho Rebounds COVID relief monies, uh, this year, there was a one-time special education for instructional and pupil services that was allocated for additional compensation. These funds were spent fully as of November. Next slide. Now we're on to the comparison charts, um, which is comparing original to revised. Keep in mind there are carryover amounts included in these amounts. And so again, I mentioned this on a previous slide, the two funds that increased significantly, significantly on this slide are 230 and 234. So your 230 is your local special projects, um, which is made up of MEF grants, local donations, and other grants. And then 234, um, at this time, most are, we've probably completed half of our sports season, so I know how much is received, so then I can adjust those numbers accordingly. Um, if you remember COVID, um, this fund took quite a hit because we did not have gate, we, we barely had any games, and so we just did not see the revenue. It is bouncing back, so I'm, I'm happy to see that, and fund balance did come in a little bit higher than projected. So that's a positive. Okay, next slide. This one has quite a few funds listed on it. So inside of the CTE fund, the 243 fund, Jason Huff, our business ed instructor, was awarded a one-time equipment grant. And then, as I stated earlier, 251 did um, have a decrease in the award amount, um, but it is receiving a interfund transfer from 271 to help support the same level of program. Um, 252, this is our SR1 fund, and as I stated earlier, we did spend this as of September. SR2 is um, one-time money as well. The expiration date on that is September of 2023. SR3, this is year two of this fund, so it's set to expire in September of 2024. Um, in 257, our award amount increased for 22-23, but it shows we have a slight decrease, and that's due to spending down some of that carryover that I talked about. 260, new student contracted services that are approximately 98% reimbursable. The district is responsible for a 23% match. The 260 fund works in conjunction with our maintenance of effort and our IDEA funds. It is a balancing act of what is needed and what is allowed to spend in each fund. At the end of the day, we must balance our Medicaid fund, ensure the correct expenses are coded to IDEA, and meet our maintenance of effort within the general fund. Next slide, please. And this is our last slide. 
271, we are working towards spending the amount of unspent dollars due to COVID. And 288, this was that special education uh, for the additional compensation for our pupil services and instructional staff. 290, a slight increase in reimbursement rate from the federal government, as well as a third supply chain relief allocation that was just recently awarded is also included in this fund, which is great to see because 290, we were a little worried about that during COVID as well. Um, still a little bit worried because uh, lunches were free and now it is a paid situation again. Uh, so we'll see what happens with that. But like I said, they did increase that federal reimbursement rate and we did, um, we now have received three supply chain um, allocations, which is very helpful. And then the 420, the last of our funds, the increased difference between budget is mainly attributed to our two buses not being received in the fiscal year. You do have to track the um, contracted busing costs or revenues as well as the depreciation that is transferred into this fund by law um, separately from your other plant facility projects and it does carry over from year to year. That concludes my proposed revised presentation. Um, if there are any questions, please feel free to ask. So why would why is there carryover in the ESSER one funds at all? There's like eight thousand, nine thousand, five hundred. So um, all of our federal programs are grant reimbursement um, mm -hmm. based, and so those dollars you have a, a dollar amount allocated, and then you ask for it each year. And if it's not, if we don't ask for all of it, then it just rolls over from year to year. Mm -hmm. So I do budget that number okay. in any given year. Any other questions, or Jennifer? Only a comment. Thank you for your help. Mm -hmm. It's oh, amazing. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I do have a question, if I could. Mm -hmm. um, it's my hot chocolate. Um, okay, uh, Mary Ellen Brewick. I don't know where this should be, so feel free to say table it. But um, I saw the MEA grants, maybe the money's coming in, to the MEA, am I, is that right? The MEF. 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 Yes. Oh, so that's different than the Moscow Education Association with yes. the teachers. Okay, so maybe this is not for that, but um, aware, being aware of like grants from the Department of Education or the Biden administration for infrastructure, would there be a possibility of a parent group or a parent, specifically at Lena, but I imagine the other schools would be interested too, in writing a grant in conjunction with someone from the school district, I don't know if you have a grant writer, to try and get external federal funds for infrastructure um, and what might that process look like or guidance or a blessing from the school district or please don't do that because it causes problems. Um, I, there is one parent who has expressed interest in taking point on that but would want to do it in a coordinated fashion. Um, Again, that might be a future thing, but when I saw the grants, I was like, oh, well, there's money coming in that we, then, then the school district would spend because it would come to the school district. It wouldn't ideally come to a parent group. I'll leave that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's yeah. a... I, I don't We've see had that it. happen before. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's... Is there someone in the district who, who writes grants or thinks no. about that? Or okay, yeah. we don't have a grant writer per se. You're, you're looking at some of them right there. <laughs> yeah, I believe it. I believe it. Yeah, but we have. I've worked with um, certain parents before. Um, Mr. Perryman at the high school oh, has. Okay. Okay. I know, um, the person in yes, Bush's job previous to him we, has. Yeah, we have to. Yeah, so. Or helped with writing grants. So, yeah. Well, we'll. Circle back to that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you, Jennifer. You're welcome. And thank you very much for keeping track of all this and making <laughs> sure it all works. <laughs> all right. So we will move on to the superintendent's report. Okay. Thank you. Uh, first off, to talk about is just that lockdown uh, scenario we had last last week on uh, Wednesday, February eighth. 
We do appreciate everyone's support during that time, uh, the parents as well as the hard work that our students and our, our staff did in, in that uh, process, as well as the um, uh, Green, or excuse me, <laughs> the Moscow Police Department and the uh, Latah County Sheriff's Department also. Uh, the work they did and uh, and the uh, fire department also assisted uh, in that scenario. Uh, we did have a debriefing afterwards uh, a few days later with the administrators and the police department. Uh, both parties felt like things went really well. A uh, couple things that we needed to uh, fix. Uh, we did notice that we did have a uh, some classrooms that didn't have a system of communication as well as we would like to. So we're looking into how, how to fix those scenarios, um, how to uh, warn people outside a little bit better, um, and just uh, processes of how, how to make sure that our, our police officers come, can get in as quickly as possible. As they told us, if, if we don't have a way, they will just drive right to the, the door. So we're trying to see if we can do something a little bit more proactive on that one. Uh, but we do appreciate the work they, they've done. Uh, I did send out a notice uh, today to the parents. You received it as well. I'm going to just uh, read it real quickly so if people didn't uh, receive it that are watching. And it just says, it's a letter to the parents and to the staff, and its district administration has been made aware of several swatting incidents happening simultaneously throughout the nation, including close to home in the Twin Falls School District. The district also received reports about a fake news story circulating that fabricates a fatality incident at another Idaho high school, which was Highland High School in Southern Idaho. These reports are false. What is swatting? What is swatting? Swatting is the action of or practice of making a prank call to emergency services in an attempt to bring about the dispatch of a large number of armed police officers to a particular address. These situations can create fear and chaos. Please know that the district is aware, vigilant, and in constant contact with law enforcement partners to address any threats made to the local schools. Please do not contact the schools about these types of rumors. Uh, thank you. Oh, uh, thank you. Was not information or updates will be distributed via official district communications. That's where the thank you came. In. Uh, but so that's something that's going around. Uh, we did have that was could have been a possibility of what happened to us last last week as well. But we do take them seriously. Uh, we did warn the principals of all the schools today when we heard about this swatting, uh, letting them know that we would go into a secure mode if, if we did get a phone, phone call such as that. Uh, we were given a kind of example of what that swatting was, which was a, a, a person that uh, breathing heavily and, and you know, uh, kind of sounded almost like a recording. But So we heard about that. Uh, just another thing that we have to deal with on an ongoing basis. So just any questions about the lockdowns or anything or any, anything that you wanted to mention there? Okay. Uh, legislative update. Uh, we will be talking about Day on the Hill, which is... Uh, on the discussion items, but I want to go through what what is basically being presented down at uh, Boise at the Capitol. And I'm just going to go through these kind of fast because I think this, these are things that the community should be aware of. Uh, some of these are concerning and uh, we, we recommend to have uh, parents, if you hear of any of these that you feel or you're concerned about, as the legislators requested, please contact them. Uh, first one is the Idaho Launch Program. Uh, this is uh, the governor's one of the governor's top priorities, and.
this is a uh, avenue of getting uh, some funds to our, our uh, Idaho students that are graduating going off to college or trade school or whatever but uh, enough funds that they believe that would take care of the first two years of schooling uh, no matter what type of schooling they're looking at or, or trade training so that's out there and the governor's really trying to push for that so uh, but and the next one is house bill 58 the school bond elections uh, this one uh, we oppose this this would remove March and August dates leaving only uh, the November and May dates how I put it is no in November we haven't even received an idea of what our funds would be because we have to wait till a legislative session so it, it's very difficult to calculate out what how to run a levy at that time for the upcoming year because we would not have a, a very good idea May is too late at that point if you're running a May May election you're probably having to if if you live off of that supplemental levy you're probably having to riff staff because until you know you have that money you'd have to notify them in advance so they have enough time to go find a job elsewhere uh, <laughs> and that's the problem is you have a good chance of losing a lot of your staff uh, at that time because they're not going to wait around to May to find out if if you will have those funds or not so this would really uh, this one bill would really be harmful to m most school districts uh, the other one is uh, they are moving the office of performance evaluations uh, to change the way the people are selected. It used to be four mem or eight members, four of each party. Uh, and this was kind of like the watchdog for, for, the, for the state legislators. And they did a study just a little while ago that was very helpful to us, and it's about facilities. And they found that the, the legislators have not met their constitutional requirement of meeting the needs of, of facilities in the school district or in, in the school districts in Idaho. Uh, this would lopside the parties and could cause less likely chance of getting uh, information that is accurate and non-biased. Uh, Next one is school property tax bill. This, this bill uh, is intended to pay down voters approval bonds and levies and rolls over any extra funds to a facility fund, a concept that can be appreciated by education. However, it also takes 50 million away from the 330 million allocated to public schools from, sep from the September 1 special session, uh, which the, means it's essentially supplanting the governor's plan to provide more operation funds and mutually it takes away our ability to fund future facilities so this is not as great as it sounds so that's a concern there's one bill that's being supported pretty heavily by everyone and that's the financial literacy bill house bill 92 and that is that all students before they graduate would have a financial literacy coursework. They said we can include that within classes we already have. So it could be there'd be some cost, but minimal. Um, there's one uh, right now, House Bill 105. It's the national model, displayed schools. It's in God we trust. This bill would require that if a public schools were donated a poster or framed copy of the representation of In God We Trust, the national motto, that it shall be posted in a conspicuous place in the school. This bill is a national trend. Uh, one of the concerns some of the uh, superintendents uh, said that if anyone can donate, uh, 
And kind of humorously, they said that they would be happy to donate to their other schools, you know, such as Moscow could donate to Lewiston School District, a nice, uh, in God we trust, in the famous colors of red, white, and black. Mm -hmm. And with maybe something at the bottom that says, Go Bears. And with that bill, you have to post every donation. Well, and that's what they're saying. <laughs> so, and so you could get a hundred of these and you'd have to put them all over the school. Yes. Yeah, so. And so we're, you know, we understand what they're trying to do, but we're just, it's to make it happen is, is there's, there's some clarifications that need to happen on that bill. Uh, Another one is school closures on election day requiring all schools to be closed on election day for a student um, student use that they could do professional development. Um, it was interesting. They said uh, determine other activities of those days could include professional de development, personnel training for staff, and teacher in service, which is all the same thing. So they, they gave three descriptions of the same thing. Um, but that's out there. Uh, and they said a lot of communities would change over to make, make that be the location. So that's uh, one thing. And they said the reason purpose of that is for safety purposes. They're scared that um, sometimes elections can get a little bit more hostile than they used to. So move them to the school? Yeah, I was just about to say that. What a great <laughs> yeah, idea. Move the kids out. Well, you you got to figure, most smaller schools use the schools already. Oh, so okay. what they're doing is trying... Yeah. Yeah. I follow. Yeah. Um, they did on House Bill 114, abuse of school employees. It used to be a bill that said that any, any person that uh, verbally abused a, a teacher in front of a student, and that could be even a parent's child, uh, could, it would be a legal offense. They are expanding that protection uh, to cover all public school employees from abuse. So that one's uh, unfortunately becoming necessary. House Bill 150, taxes, uh, late charges, interests, that's uh, penalties and interest on property taxes. I don't know. That one's just, I don't know a lot about that one, to be honest with you. Um, uh, House Bill 151, school boards and trustees elections, uh, trustee elections, rezoning. This just is legislation that if your zones change, that you can still finish uh, your term in that zone. Uh, for that remainder term, even if your your home moves outside of that that area, uh, and then this is the the big one that was down there that's got probably the most attention is the Freedom in Education Savings Account, the ESA voucher. Um, as you read in the paper today how much, you know, they, they were predicting $44 million costs and it would roughly, wasn't that $44 million and it would jump up to... Yeah, I didn't study uh, the numbers, but it increased significantly. It was yeah, the general extreme. Gist. And that's what's happening in the other states that this has been going on. Because they didn't calculate up all the kids that are currently in private schools. I believe this is the case currently in private schools that would utilize those funds they're thinking of just the kids that aren't going to school hmm. which was a sl much smaller percentage uh, and they also stayed in there that if they use that that it would allow uh, students that are low income to have a better access to private schools however they stated that they would not put any parameters in these funds going to a private uh, company or private school which says that they could increase their tuition by that 5590 and still have their their tuition they had so basically not allowing 
students that are low income to to attend and that was probably the biggest argument that we have is there's so much accountability in public education and there's really absolutely no accountability in in the private schools or homeschooling where this state is probably the least restricted homeschooling in the nation because there's absolutely no requirements whatsoever so if someone could ask for that five thousand five hundred ninety dollars have their child at home not educate them and just gain a, a amount of money um, as I told someone, you might as well just put $5,590 in a can and kick it down a stream. Uh, there'd be absolutely no no amount. Uh, it, and, yes. The other problem with that is half of the counties in Idaho have no private schools. Exactly. So this is a, I won't use the word ploy, but a strategy to uh, steer money to private schools in urban areas. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's going to defund uh, rural public schools. And the question quite a few people have on that one is who's asking for the, this in the state of Idaho? We're hearing it's more coming from out of state, uh, as well as if uh, some of the companies that are pushing this pretty hard are out of state all the way into Florida. K-12 is one program. Uh, and I think uh, taxpayers should wonder if they really want their tax dollars going out of state. So uh, I did talk with two of our legislators. They didn't think it would pass this year, but it's something that I, I would recommend our community members, both who have kids as well as don't have kids, but are paying taxes should stay, keep aware of that. But they those legislators also said there's what six or seven other bills Bill, of this there are type quite a few bills that are all up. doing that so. that they're trying to get one of them to pass so it is something that uh and they did ask have people communicate with them um I thought the other really valuable point about that bill is that it suggests that private schools or home schools are the only option for parental choice if like what we think of as traditional public school doesn't fit their student, and yet the public school system offers so much choice to begin with between the charter schools that are part of our public system, but also all the ways you can customize your child's education within the public school yes. system. It's Even it's electronic, really, Idle Digital Learning Academy is a public school entity that works with public schools. So. It's a really bad faith argument to say that there is no choice unless parents can just direct their money away from the public school. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one one uh, new uh, thing, a 21-month bond repayment. Uh, this legislation would remove a critical tool from school districts who have a voter-approved bond for, from using a 21-month uh, payment option. This is usually used so that they can have consistency in their levy. Uh, that they can pay it off within that period and just run a smaller one, but uh, can keep going. Um, and then uh, this one uh, would be supportive uh, is impact fees for school districts. This legislation is supported by Idaho School Boards Association resolution. So simply the bill adds school districts as eligible entities to collect development and impact fees and school buildings as eligible infrastructure. You know, this is basically if your community is growing, uh, you know, uh, immensely due to new corporations coming in or new housing developments that uh, there could be uh, tax there that could help pay for schools um, they are talking about a bill uh, Senate bill 1069 where a teacher apprentice basically student teachers uh, could possibly be paid while they're doing their apprenticeship uh, and then we watched the bill, uh, the sex education before fifth grade bill in the Senate ed program. 
And that bill was basically saying that sex education could not be taught before fifth grade, but it also included such things as having conversations that happen some day, days, and I'm going to be frank about this. It's, it's uh, when uh, uh, possibly uh, a young lady uh, in fourth grade that would have a menstrual cycle and wasn't prepared for that, uh, the way this bill is written, that a uh, teacher could not communicate with them about what was happening to their body at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, the scary part about this bill was they were asked, why did you bring this? Because it's, is this an issue? And they said, no, they're doing it just for cautionary purposes. Uh, they said that Boise School District was working with the city of Boise, Boise to have uh, education, uh, sex education from pre-K to 12, which, you know, and then he said, did you talk to Boise School District? The person said no. They said they just had a, a, a note from a person. This is a person from Quarter Lane. Uh, uh, Boise School District uh, board member spoke and said, we have not had that conversation. It was in talked by the mayor of Boise three years ago, but then dropped at that point. So they really questioned, why are we putting a bill up for something that is not happening and has not been uh, shown as being a problem? Just in case, someday in the someday future, someday in the future, yeah. <laughs> it passed six to two to go onto the floor. And um, just to put a little finer point on it, it wasn't the mayor of Boise; it was a citizen group that was the advising yeah. the city of Boise, as our community has lots of citizen advisory groups. Okay. They produced a document that said we think that we should work with the school district to work on this mm -hmm. right. for equality reasons. And that was the totality of the plan, was they produced an aspirational document that was neither endorsed by the city nor the school district. Yeah. And went away at that point. And went away. <laughs> so. uh, but this is what they And the doing. last one that I, I, I would say, it, and this one impacts, uh, actually there's two more I want to talk about. One is open enrollment. And this would be that legislation would change how Idaho's open enrollment statute works. And it would say it was based off as just the enrollment in, in the classroom, the class sizes. And they would determine the class sizes. And if the state, we, the state would, right. and if these sizes, class sizes were not reached, then anyone outside of the district would have access to enroll their, their child into our school. However, I asked the question, our school district, our taxpayers pay 42% of our general fund in our local taxes. One of the reasons why we don't open out of district enrollment is because we believe that students, families that have paid these taxes should have the smallest class sizes as possible for their, their children and not allow people that leave our community because they don't want to pay those taxes and come back in but utilize those, those taxes. So this is something that as stewards of our tax payers' dollars, I, I really kind of am concerned that state legislators are trying to dictate how we can utilize those when they're not willing to pay the amounts for our... our you know, it would, so in Moscow's case, yeah. it would cost us money that we're not getting back because you have people who are not taxpayers benefiting from Moscow schools, but it also would hurt our surrounding districts like Troy and Potlatch right. because those students wouldn't be going there, so they wouldn't so be they getting get any money. Well. <laughs> so so they get less money and we pay more money. Yeah. So, it, yeah. 
it hurts everybody. Yep. And the last one I, is just the endowment land funds and school facilities. This one would help Moscow School District. This is the legislation redirects revenues from the Idaho endowment lands to specifically be used for Idaho K-12 school facilities. A distribution formula based on square footage and school population is used to disperse the funding. It would equal roughly to $61 million of funding. So that would uh, help help our, our school systems. It, it moves us better towards getting some of those facility needs that we need. So that's uh, it for legislative update. I will tell uh, one other thing. Uh, just I will be sending out uh, our annual engagement survey for both our parents and for our staff. We do three different engagement surveys, one parents, one staff, and one students. The administrators of each building will be uh, doing uh, the survey for the students, but I'll be sending out a survey to a uh, site for all parents to do it. They used to, in the past, they always said, pick one child of your family, and family and do that survey they've opened it up so if you have four kids please do four surveys one for each of your kids which i think is a lot more fair i mean that gives us a better reading of of people's feelings so uh but that's coming out uh, at that point i know jen jen you don't have a report today i feel like i talked enough yeah <laughs> Uh, Shannon Richards could not be here tonight, so we've got, uh, let's start with Butch. Thank you, Dr. Bailey. Uh, just a quick update on buildings and grounds. Uh, we are finally fully staffed on our custodial uh, crew uh, for the first time since I've arrived. Uh, and just want to uh, thank all the dedicated staff who have made changes to their schedules uh, to keep our, our schools clean and, and safe for the students, staff, and the community. Uh, for technology, uh, we distributed new Chromebooks that were part of a grant last summer across the district. And we're also assessing uh, summer projects that will include doing some updates to wireless access points as well as other projects. Uh, for transportation, we're preparing to equip five of our newer buses to be Wi-Fi compatible. Uh, this will include trip buses that allow students to work on assignments while traveling on extracurricular events. Uh, that project is going to be starting the first week in April. Uh, finally, uh, with student nutrition, we're working on lots of different ways to uh, reduce our student nutrition debt. Uh, we created a new use of our school messenger that'll, that contacts families uh, via phone and, uh, and gives them reminders of how to pay off that student debt. Uh, also in that area, we're preparing for our summer feeding program as well as working on a 10-year plan for our replacement of equipment in all of our kitchens. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and Carrie Brooks, curriculum director. Um, <clears throat> I apologize for missing. Um, last month, we had a district office flu bug going around. <laughs> and uh, But I did send out um, some information on how to access the state um, or the Moscow School District state report card. And thank you, Jim, for, I, I was watching from home, so I realized I had messed up that hyperlink and corrected it. And so unless you have any questions about that, um, that's really all I have. Um, other than I wanted to share with you that we did have our federal programs review yesterday and we did not have any findings. Um, they said it was one of the cleanest reports they've um, had the pleasure of um, doing. Um, they did have some recommendations and I'll be implementing several of those recommendations from the State Department. So, anyway. So that's the end of my report. All right. Well, thank you. Okay. So we move on to our first discussion item, uh, bond refinancing. So Dr. Bailey, okay. uh, I'll let you get it set up there. Uh, I'm going to have to be here just for a second to uh, open up a, hold on there. I'm trying to get my mouse working. Did you want to? Unblock the camera just so at least he can see somebody that he's talking to, even yeah, if it's not all of us. <laughs> just give me one second here. Um, okay. Um, yeah, it's
Still so got you, Greg? Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah, just hold on here. Yep. I'm just trying to well, I'm not get in there. I did point that out to our chair. Okay, well, but he did respond. <laughs> the day. Okay. I'll play Katie did that, not me. <laughs> so she knows. Well, I uh Just a minute. I just got to get the main projector going, okay? Yep, no problem. Slight technical difficulties. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sorry, both. It started by 15. Mm. My alarm went off at over 45, and that was brutal. So who's that with? Brian Capuana or John? Uh, it's uh, it's uh, there he is. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm making big. Oh, I'm making big. I'm making big. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, my, mom, my wife went to right. Sherry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Not at 5 15 in the morning. <laughs> Hey! hey. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. I'm, I'm just envisioning a giant picture of me on a screen. <laughs> yeah. That's it. That's what you got. Yeah. <laughs> but you look really good, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You're on. So should, okay. Um, and I think I'll share my screen because I'll, I'll walk through the presentation. Uh, it says you've disabled the participant screen sharing. Oh, okay. <laughs> you got to come back, Greg. I'm coming. I'm going to make it call host. This one? No, 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 no. no. over. Yeah, oh, that one. <laughs> All right. No, I want Hold on. Oh, that's your screen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, do it again. There we go. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, uh, good, e good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Herringer. I'm with Piper Sandler. Uh, I actually worked on the school district's existing bond that was sold back in 2013. Um, and, you know, it might seem like an odd time to be talking about refinancing bonds when um, we're in an interest rate environment that a lot of people know has increased uh, pretty substantially compared to a year ago. Um, but part of the reason, you know, we have been monitoring the opportunity for the district to uh, refinance this bond issue uh, over the last couple, three years, but there's certain tax laws uh, and, and rules around tax exempt bond financing, refinancings that have, uh, you know, that have factored into why, why, we've, why we've recommended waiting until now to consider a bond refinance. Um, so this is a, just a summary of the district's existing bond that was passed in 2013, <laughs> just under 10 million. Uh, it was sold uh, in August 2013. It has a final maturity 20 years later uh, in 2033. The true interest cost on that bond issue is about 
<coughs> uh, and that's a blend of the different uh, interest rates that, that were um, on the bond. And it's, and it's all fixed rate. Uh, it's, you know, the interest rate on that bond's all, all a fixed rate. But the amount outstanding is $6.6 .6 million. And then here's the key thing, um, that there's a call feature, or what we also, also known as an optional redemption feature, that's the that, when you sold the bonds, you told bond holders that you know, the bonds that mature in 2024 to 2033, that you would pay interest on those bonds for at least 10 years, but after the 10th year, you had the option to uh, pay them off early. Uh, what, what, and that's the optional redemption feature. And it's we also call it a call date. Uh, the district's allowed to call those bonds away from investors beginning on August 15 of 2023. So that's coming up this year, um, and that's and that's kind of the key date. And the reason it's a key date is because uh, if under, under tax law, and the tax law has changed uh, since 2013, but basically uh, if you have a bond refinancing within 90 days of that call date, uh, it can be a tax exempt refinancing. And that means that the interest rates on the bonds that you sell, you know, you'd use to refinance your old bonds, the, uh, would, the interest would be exempt from federal and state income tax and therefore have a lower interest rate uh, than if, if the bonds were taxable. If the refinancing occurs more than 90 days from that call date, then the bonds have to be taxable and therefore have a higher interest rate. Um, there's also some other inefficiencies that occur if you refinance more than 90 days prior to the call date because you know it's not like with a, uh, a home refinance where you, know, you refinance a, your, your mortgage and you pay off the old mortgage right away and you start on the new mortgage the next day. Um, this is, you can't actually pay off those old bonds until August 15th of, of 2023. So in the meantime, there's a an escrow account that you know proceeds go in. You, know, you refinance and you put the proceeds of a new bond issue into an escrow account that pays off the old bond <coughs> at the call date. And so there's the longer there's a that time period where the money's in an escrow account before the call date uh, creates some inefficiencies as well. Um, so all that is to say that this is. You know, we kind of had on our board that we would make sure we check in with the Moscow School District, uh, talk to you about the refinancing early on in, in 2023 so that you have time to think about whether it's something you want to pursue. And then uh, if you do want to pursue it, you have enough time uh, to, to execute and, and, and maximize the, where you're at with this call date. So... I kind of described this a little bit in the bond refunding process. So, you know, basically, you know, you sell new bonds with a, you know, that should have a lower interest rate than what you're paying on your old bonds. The money from that sale, let's say, you know, we, we close that sometime in late May within 90 days of that August 15 call date. The money from the bond sale goes into an escrow account. It's invested in U.S. Treasury securities until... 815 of 2023 so there's there's a period there for three months where you know the money's actually earning some interest as well uh, and then on in uh, on that call date it, you know the money in that escrow is used to pay the interest on the bonds plus pay off all the old bonds and then you you move forward with making your payments on the the bond the bonds that were issued this year to refinance the old bonds. Um, so, you know, question is how much can you save? Uh, I think let's get right to the point. We assume that you refinance all of the callable bonds. The average coupon of those bonds that are outstanding and can be called is 4.08%. And the average payment on your existing bonds is $757,000 per year. So that's the average, you know, bond payment. Uh, we assume that you'd close this within the 90-day time frame, uh, May 18, use the ratings that you know, we have on the school bond guarantee program, the, the bond rating of AAA, which helps you get 
very low interest rates because of that credit rating from the state, along with a good underlying rating from the district. We ran this analysis in January, um, and so rates have kind of they've come down since that time period, but in the last week or so they've come back up. And so, you know, these numbers are an estimate of where about where we're at with the market. Uh, could be a little higher, a little lower today than they were back in January. Um, and here's the sort of say we ran three different savings uh, scenarios. So the first one is just kind of the standard level savings. So refinance, lower the payment, save money. Uh, so in this case, we show net savings uh, on your you know bond payments of about five hundred and forty five thousand um, dollars, and that's and you know that assumes the district you know sells bonds together with some money it has in its bond fund, uses the proceeds of the bond the new bond with together with money in the bond fund to pay off the old bonds, and then um, the payments going forward reflect what it would take to pay on the new bonds. So you look here, you, you could, you know, this would actually drop the annual levy from 760,000 down to something like 645,000 and still have a 2033 final maturity. We, we took another scenario and said, okay, well, let's, let's assume we keep the payments the same and just shorten you know, we keep making the same payment, but pay the bond off a little quicker. Uh, that will naturally save more money because you you amortize your debt faster and you pay it off sooner. And so the net uh, savings of that scenario is about seven hundred thousand. And then we did this third scenario, which is you know the district over the last couple of years has actually been levying about nine hundred thousand. Um, it's been building up some balance in its bond fund. Uh, and if you stayed at that $900,000 a year levy that you've had the lap, for the last couple of years, again, it allows you to amortize the bonds faster, get them paid off sooner, and therefore the potential savings over the long run is, is higher at $818,000. So there's a, there's a real savings opportunity um, to, you know, either – you know, capture some immediate savings and deliver those right away, or you know, keep the payments the same, and 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 capture bigger savings over the long the long term. Um, I'm going to pause for a second and just if, see if there are questions. It's uh, it's hard to do sometimes to do these presentations over Zoom, um, but hopefully you've had a chance to look at this packet of information and and. Uh, well, let's just see if you have any questions. So I have a quick question, Eric. It's kind of a stupid one, but why aren't the payments uh, equal across every year? Why do they wiggle around a bit? Yeah, no, good question. Uh, bonds are sold in $5,000 increments. And and so we're always going to have some some variance, plus or minus 5000 um, because it's not like a bank loan where it's like a, a, to the penny. What if what if you went with an earlier final maturity um, and then ran into issues five years down the road? What what kind of penalties are you talking? Well, what I mean, once you sell the bonds, you're committed to making the payments as scheduled. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, I guess I I. I I wonder what kind of difficulties you'd run into. Yeah, then. no, I, I just mean things change and uh, you wanted to, again, uh, reassess the situation. Could you go back to a 2033 um, maturity date? But, you know, I don't, um, I'd have to defer to bond council and thankfully we have one on, on the phone. Um, I've never really, you know, when we've shortened a bond issue, we never really run across a, a situation where we want where later it was decided to extend it back out to yeah. the original final maturity um, because remember your bonds are paid from a, a dedicated property tax levy mm -hmm. that can only be used to repay the bonds um, so you know you don't you, you levy specifically for the bond 
Uh, that money that comes in can't be used for anything else but paying off bonds. It can't be transferred to the general fund or used for a capital project. You know, and conversely, um, you're not having to come out of your general fund to make your bond payments. So, you know, pretty pretty rare. I mean, I can't really think of a circumstance where you know a district said it would say, okay, now we have a reason to go extend it back out. And you know, unless unless you were adding a new bond and you wanted to, mm-hmm. you know, maybe spread out the payments when you're going to over, you know, overlap another bond issue. Mm-hmm. And if that were the case, I'd probably, you know, maybe be less aggressive with the shortening up. Mm-hmm. Isn't that why these bonds are so attractive to people is just because there's really a safety, uh, they're, they're probably safer than a lot some bonds just because of how they're set up with school districts. Am I right on that? Or oh yeah, absolutely. No, the the bond, school bonds in Idaho are extremely um, safe as an investment because it does come, you know, with that property tax pledge that you know in Idaho you know you got to get a two thirds super majority vote to incur debt and. But when you get that vote, you also get the ability to levy a property tax specifically to repay uh, the bonds. And that, that pledge of the property tax is, is sort of unlimited as to rate or amount. So whatever it takes, even if your tax base got cut in half for some, you know, I mean, let's say, you know, big business moves out of town or the legislature changes the way the property you know property is assessed and and the, and the tax base gets cut in half then the rate has to get doubled to generate the, the money so there's never really a circumstance where you know the, the, the bond is you know the bond levy is not going to be enough to make the bond payment yeah. it just could have some impact on what the tax rate is of course right any other questions mm-hmm. So, so I wanted I wanted to present this just you know again we 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 were looking at this in in 2020 when interest rates were were very low um, and you can see from the chart here you know during the pandemic right at the beginning of the pandemic interest rates spiked uh, they went uh, and really low uh, all the way up until about January of 2022 and then we saw a pretty significant rise in interest rates. So that, that's all true, but you know, if you look here, the analysis we ran in a assuming a 2020 bond issue, yes, the interest rate would have been lower, but the net savings to the district uh, would not be as significant as you could achieve today. And part of that, I mean, the real reason behind that is because of the escrow. Uh, if we would have refinanced in 2020. The money would have been, from that refinancing would have had to sit in an escrow account for three years, uh, invested in U.S. Treasuries that were paying next to zero, uh, and so there just the inefficiency of that three-year escrow really sort of hurt the savings that you know the, kind of offset the benefit of a really low rate environment. So yes, we are at a higher rate interest rate today than we would have been. Um, Two or two, you know, a little over two years ago, but the savings are, are more positive. Uh, you know, almost what, at least one hundred fifty thousand more uh, in savings uh, because of a, a more efficient escrow. Uh, and I, you know, like, ho- hopefully that makes sense. It, it, we we did have a discussion with uh, the district with Jen and, and and Greg about you know, hey, yeah, you could save some money now, but probably better to wait until you're at this 2023 call date. So it's nice to see that that wasn't a bad recommendation. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So refunding considerations, uh, you know, so this can be all be done without a vote. I mean, you don't need to go back out to the voters to approve a refinancing bond issue as long as you don't exceed the repayment term on the bond, so we can't go. We can't extend this beyond 2033. Uh, you have you cannot increase the amount of debt outstanding, which you know you you wouldn't need to. Uh, and you also have to produce savings. Um, and the key thing there is savings overall. 
uh, you know, there you could increase your payments and if you wanted to and pay it off quicker. Uh, you can have you know level savings, but you have to, you just have to be, you have to show that you know it's going to save the taxpayers money in the long in the long run. Um, it will reduce the bond levy equalization subsidy. That's the amount of money the state, uh, you know, pays on. on um, it's a program the state has where if you pass a bond, the state you know, will send a subsidy payment to offset what you need to levy locally. For, the, for Moscow School District, it, you only get 10% of the interest cost. So whatever interest savings are achieved, the state you know is going to share. In, in those savings, so they'll send you a little bit less in subsidy because you're reducing your cost uh, burden, which um, you know seems like a fair trade-off. It's not you're not going to end up in a worse position. It's just that states basically say, hey, if you're lowering your payments, then we're going to lower our subsidy a little bit. And then I, I mentioned this last piece about the, you know doing a refinancing. It gives you the opportunity to you know restructure your payments. Um, some districts might try to you know, build in a drop off when they think they're going to run a new bond. Uh, other districts that I, a lot of districts I work with would try to you know, pursue the idea of keeping the payments the same and paying it off quicker. Um, so lots of different things you can do there. Um, and so I guess you know the, the kind of the, my summary here is that the opportunity to you know refinance is there. The savings uh, amounts are pretty significant. Um, because it's an efficient refunding if you, you know, the decision is, you know, do you want to do it or not? Uh, and then if, you, if the answer is yes, um, you know, how do you want to structure the savings? And, um, you know, we, we, we will, I will pause there and see if there's any further questions on any of that. Any other questions? No. no. Okay. I will stop sharing my screen then. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, and we'll, um, I think, you know, like I said, the next steps are if the district wants to continue down the road of looking at this, then the next, there's really no official action until. Um, you know, we, we work with bond council to prepare a uh, bond resolution that would authorize the refinancing to proceed subject to meeting some minimum savings targets. Uh, and so then, you know, this, if this is just for informational purposes, but if we got, you know, indication back that you wanted to take, kind of take the next step, we work with Chelsea to prepare that resolution to, to authorize the you know, actually authorize moving forward with the refinancing. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for thank going you. over that with us. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate it. Yep. Yeah. Have a good evening. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Thanks. Thank Chelsea, you. thank you, too. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. So we will move on to sec the next discussion item, update on the superintendent search. And so um, so our one of our uh, candidates has uh, dropped out. Um, so um, Daniel Barker has withdrawn his name from the search. So now we're down to two. And we have set it up that on... Uh, Monday, March 6th, March 6th, <laughs> uh, even though there was a typo in that email that ISBA sent us, but March 6th, uh, we will have uh, Brian Lee, and then on March 7th, uh, Sean Teagues. And so I am uh, finalizing the exact schedule on those days and the stakeholder groups, and then we'll start uh, getting the questions squared away and all of that. And so each of them will culminate with a board the board interview and executive session once they do their presentations and uh, with all the different stakeholders and so forth. And so I'll be, as soon as that schedule is finished for actual times, uh, then we will be announcing that and publicizing that so that everybody knows. And that 
will be done in the next day or so. I'll have it finalized. So. Do you have a timeline for questions? For getting which questions? I'm sorry. Um, suggesting interview questions. Yeah, basically, once I have the schedule finalized, each group will so um, the will have the district, um, and I'll again just run through the rough one here. So the first one will be the um, district office staff. And so we'll start with them. And so we will solicit ahead of time questions uh, from the district office staff. And so the candidate will come in, say, hi, this is who I am, and then answer those questions. And they, that we have to have the same questions for each candidate for each of the visits. Then we'll move on to the admin council, um, which will be the administrators, the directors, uh, and we will solicit questions from all of uh, those people ahead of time that will then be asked to that. Then we'll move on to the PAT leadership for all the schools, and they will s submit questions ahead of time that we will then, uh, that can be asked. Okay. Um, then the candidate will visit support services, the bus board. Uh, then we'll visit all the schools, so throughout the rest of the day there. Hopefully, when while visiting the high school, they will have a very brief chat with the student body leadership, you know, that they'll be able to chat with them. Uh, and, of course, there will be lunch in there for the candidate and some breaks, but, you know, as we spread it out. Uh, at 3.30, we will have the teaching staff. They will meet with the teaching staff. Um, and the teaching staff will, will have questions submitted ahead of time. The MEA has already submitted some questions they would like asked, and so we pick those to do that. Uh, then there will be dinner with the board in chit chat, and then we will have the community session, um, and the community session questions will be taken off the survey because we got some really good questions on that survey, and so we'll be pulling them off of that. And then after the community session, we'll do the interviews with the board. Uh, which is an executive session. Now, at each of the stops, each of the groups, uh, we will ask for feedback from those groups of what do they see as the strengths of each candidate. So, so just the strengths. You know, we think this is a strength that candidate has, this is a strength that candidate has, because we do not want it to turn into, I don't like the way they look, or I, you know, the, you know get into the negative, nitpicky stuff, but what are their strengths? That of each candidate that we can compare, and that we'll use that feedback to help in our decision as well. All right. So, so how soon do you need questions to use at the trustee interview? Um, well, um, I I will send you a date because uh, okay. I got to look at I got to get the schedule finished, and then we'll. Okay. But maybe as soon as possible. As soon as possible. <laughs> as soon as possible, and the ISBA has also their sample. They have a whole question bank that we can help us that we can look at and use some of them or adapt some of them or... So you'll send those to us? To, yeah. To the ISBA is going to send those to me. and so To look over. And to look over. Okay. And, and <laughs> at the very least, generate ideas of yeah. questions. So okay. if we don't want to use them exactly. And so... But yeah, I mean, the main thing is we need to have it, the questions ready to give to the ISBA so that they're ready to do... The first one on March 6th, that okay. they have them yep. so that they can uh, go through them and vet them because they're going to give us advice back on the questions too of like, well, maybe you shouldn't ask that question because that gets into areas that are illegalities that you can't ask. There are certain questions you can't ask um, because of federal law. Um, and so and so they'll vet them, you know, just for that, you know, that and that kind of idea or give us advice on it. it and so I know that we're in discussion items right now so I don't mm -hmm. know if this is more of an action item thing but mm -hmm. um, at our last special meeting when we were talking about the schedule mm -hmm. um, we had talked about when we would have a final meeting with the board to be able to make a decision um, mm -hmm. and I didn't know if we needed to be looking at our calendars now that we know mm -hmm. when we're actually doing the interviews if we should be setting a time when then we'll meet to review the feedback and Discuss. Right. Yeah, because we'll do the board, the two board interviews on that Monday and Tuesday, mm -hmm. and 
Then, there had been discussion about having a midnight meeting. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, that, is, that, that is an issue is if, <laughs> if we're, because I mean, our, our, our done date for that day is 10 p.m. We want to be finished by 10 p.m. because the candidate That's will be exhausted by yes. then. And so we, it, earlier in that, if, you know, if it works out, but, you know, that's kind of the drop uh, cutoff date. And then the question is, you know, it's 10 o'clock and we're done with the second candidate. Do we want to sit and discuss, you know, the candidates while we're exhausted or not? Or should we do an, another meeting and I would advocate for another meeting. Yeah. yeah. I don't understand how we how we uh, consider the feedback that we're getting if there's not. Right. We need time to consider. I mean, we'll get it right yeah. away, but we won't have time to really look at it. Well, well, it, the community meeting, they're going to turn it in. Okay. And we'll have it, yeah. but we yeah. won't yeah. really have a whole lot of time to You'll look at it. You'll be getting okay. information immediate. throughout we're the not, day. Okay. We're getting we're not it immediately. We're not allowing any lag in no. feedback. No, they fill it out. Oh, yeah. by hand and turn it in. And so we're getting the feedback right away, but we also will not have a whole lot of time to read that feedback and consider yeah. it. Yeah. So, well, But yeah. we will get them right away. We'll get it that same day. Mm -hmm. Well, so We may have a feeling after the first day how long, like if we want to take half an hour after the 10 or 9.30 or whatever cutoff time, um, to review feedback right then. Um, but even executive session, we have to have the meeting posted 48 hours? 24 at least. 24, yeah. that yeah. is. Okay. So, well, this is an emergency. so if we want, <laughs> if we were planning on doing a third executive session to yeah. I see. go over it, we would have to have that set up ahead of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we Which wouldn't is, be able yeah. to do it in a... We had blocked out Wednesday night, I thought. I, yes, we I did. don't see any reason why. It's e In my mind, if we're trying to finish things up that week, mm -hmm. it's either Wednesday or Thursday. Somebody had an issue with Thursday. Yeah, we had Wednesday open because that would have been the third candidate, oh, except Thursday. they've now you, dropped out. Wednesday, would, if I can make a recommendation, would be a, a good time to do it because once you interview someone, it, you don't want to wait too yeah, long sure. to. Yeah. But. Uh, I would certainly be in favor of scheduling a meeting for Wednesday, March 8th to mm -hmm. finish okay. this off. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we can schedule an executive meeting then, and then that way we can... I can be here by 7.30 on Wednesday, March 8th. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm fine with that. All right, so let's schedule the third executive session on Wednesday, March 8th at 7, 7.30, and then... We can, and it gives us t time. Mm -hmm. That way, we have we'll be we fresh. sleep on it, and we're fresh, <laughs> you know, and that kind of idea. So, okay. so will there be open session at all on that same day, or just executive session? Um. Well, that's the question. Is Maybe. that I do not know because if we make it, the goal is to make a decision on the eighth of who we're going make an to offer to make an offer to, and. Do we have to announce the not, making? Not until after you make the offer and they accept, accept it. So then we wouldn't need an open session then. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's what I was thinking, yeah. but I wasn't sure of the how that works. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we would need an open session. Okay. And then we would make the offer, see if it's accepted, then we would could announce it. Okay. okay. All right. We're getting closer. <laughs> okay, any other questions on that? All right. So we'll move on to report uh, from ISBA, Day on the Hill. You skipped one discussion. I, I did? Where? Uh-uh. No. Oh, I'm sorry. I was ahead I just, by one discussion. Uh, I, yeah, I was going to say. Mm -hmm. I, I was ahead. So. <laughs> um, and so, uh, Day on the Hill. Uh, uh, report on it, and so thoughts, reports. I thought it was one of the best ones I've been to. Mm -hmm. I particularly liked the um, session where different members of or different trustees from around the state um, spoke to the House Ed Committee 
<clears throat> about positive things that were happening in their districts. Mm -hmm. There's some amazing things happening in public education. And that was a lot better than the, the usual presentations yeah. they do. I thought yeah. that was a much more informational that each you know region had one of the districts get up and say, talk about, yeah, here's what's good going on in our district, all the good things, and then here's a concern we have. And they did that all the way through all nine regions, and I thought that gave us some real solid information instead of the usual kind of speech. <laughs> well, and gave the committee yeah, <laughs> some gave them good a insights. Lot of information. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, I thought both panels were good, the stakeholder panel with representatives from the different yes. agencies, State Board of Education and, the, and all, you know, the different ones. And then even, you know, the, the, with the uh, representatives and senators, you had two Democratic senators and two Republicans, uh, or two Democrats and two Republicans, two senators and two representatives. And so they all answered questions. And, and I thought that was really interesting that, you know, they all four came out strong on pub those four. <laughs> they all came out on strong on public education, and so that was good. I, I would encourage you, you know, for 15 years I've been setting up those meetings with our local legislators. I just mm -hmm. encourage you to continue that because mm -hmm. I think that's one of the most vital things we can do is have that sit-down conversation uh, mm -hmm. with our school district as well as their other school districts. Uh, and I would recommend we continue to take the lead in that because it does give us a little bit stronger voice, to be honest with you. Yeah. And it was a good conversation. We, yes, we had we, we had two of Representative our, McCann and Representative Mitchell, Mitchell sat and attended, talked with us and uh, we told them what we were worried about and our concerns and everything else, and they seemed to listen. So and, uh, we did uh, invite Senator Foreman. Uh, he said he was going to be there but did not attend so we did not have an opportunity to talk to him but yeah uh, representative Mitchell and McCann were mm -hmm. open to uh, mm -hmm. discuss what our issues were and and, and representing McCann seemed very supportive I thought you know so that was good mm -hmm. you know I was amazed that there um, talking with us about how influential outside influences are on the legislature this season. Influences from outside our state are directing what's happening in our legislature instead of the needs of our school districts mm -hmm. and our students and our, our, communities. our communities. Yeah, I, um, I was just blown away with, with uh, that thought and mm -hmm. how can we redirect that narrative to what we need instead of this might happen or that might happen or that's happening in another state and and this ought to happen in Idaho and mm -hmm. we kind of go but right. our our worries are the launch and the um, vouchers and um, yeah mm -hmm. I, there, there needs to be more discussion along yeah, well, the, our need, our the, needs. The, the senators and representatives on the panel basically stated that a lot of this stuff is distractions. Yes. They're, they're, they're wasting their time and distracting them and not getting real things done. It because takes they're time doing and all energy. these other yeah. things, these ridiculous bills that are coming forward that they have to deal with. Mm -hmm. And so. Um, I was um, obviously, I have a very. Um, personal perspective on this, but I thought it was really interesting that despite the fact that we were there to talk about um, K through 12 public schools, that during the um, ISPA kind of presentation about the different things that were going right or the needs in the various regions of the state, childcare came up over and over and over again. And um, treating the zero through five population of children as just totally separate from our K through 12 system is really missing a lot of opportunity when we talk about literacy, when we talk about workforce development, um, a whole host of things. So obviously as somebody who's in the trenches in childcare right now, um, it was really heartening to me to hear about all the creative things that are happening in districts like St. Mary's and Genesee where they're trying to bring preschool online to help their community. And I want to compliment you on your speaking <laughs> to the uh, 
House Ed Committee uh, on on daycare. They asked, did anybody want to speak? And Dulce basically jumped out of her seat. (laughs) I got some thoughts. Knocked me down. I got some thoughts. And so you gave a very informative, passionate, personal (laughs) take on it that they, I think they really listened to you. So it was good. Thank you. All right. Anything else anybody would like to say about it? No, it's very helpful. Uh, I mean, uh, I don't know if I influenced anybody's votes, but uh, the things that I thought were most helpful were hearing from uh, the different representatives, so I got a better sense of how things are going in Boise and what's going on and what they face. And then also, um, oh, better understanding of what uh, are the key issues coming up in the legislature so that I can then correspond with my representatives like everybody should be doing. So, uh, because the more they hear from Idahoans, then the less likely they are to listen to outside influences, at least that would be my hope. So while I was down there, I fired off a letter to my senator letting him know how I felt about the ESA bill. So he hasn't responded yet, but... All right. Thank you. Okay. Upcoming education law seminar seminar in Boise, uh, April 24th to 25th. And Angie needs to know <laughs> uh, if who is going so she can get it to end. And I am not going this year. I, I'm not able to go. So I have another conference I have to do. So I think I'm going to pass as well, partly because it would involve missing six lectures because uh, I have an executive board meeting that starts uh, Friday at noon. These people must not work. And um, so uh, I'd have to leave like Thursday after class and get down there in time for noon on Friday. So I think I'll probably try and Zoom the executive board meeting and then just skip the uh, head law conference, unfortunately. I will not be attending. You don't want to get one more in there before you retire? <laughs> I would be attending, but uh, the second day is my anniversary, and I think for one, I... You're going to have to spend a lot of time with her soon. You... <laughs> you, you, you that's true. Now, you did not go last year what because it was your anniversary, yeah, so better, you didn't go. You better <laughs> do something real nice for the age. anniversary. He was with her last year, too. Yeah, all right, so... You spent last anniversary with your wife. Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to up a meeting on Valentine's That's Day. Oh, boy. So I better. Uh, yeah. No. Uh, at this time, I, I just uh, think it would, at, at the late time that I'd be here, I don't think it's worth the finances of the district. Anybody uh, else know at this point? I don't know yet. Okay. I. Yeah, I doubt it will be yeah. moving a business somewhere around that. And we can look at the agenda because it may be something that one of our staff members might want to go to, too, because we, we typically will look at the agenda and see if there's specifics about, you know, finances. And Jen will go if it's HR. We got Heidi, you know, and, and so forth. So. Okay. Well, if, if you're thinking about going, make sure Angie knows. Soon, so that she can take care of it. So yeah. By uh, what does it say here? March fourth. So she needs to know. Yeah. All right. We'll move on to our first action item: revised budget for 2022-2023. Jennifer Johnson. Okay. The administration brings proposed budget revisions to the board for approval mid-year. Revising the current budget to reflect known allocations will enable the administration to monitor monthly reports and make accurate projections. Per Idaho Code, a revised budget hearing was held earlier this evening outlining the changes. Revising the 22-23 budget gives board approval for spending allocations that are now known as opposed to projected figures. 
I'll move that the Board of Trustees of Moscow School District Number 281 hereby approves the, the revised 2022-2023 budget as presented at the hearing held earlier this evening. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Further discussion? I'd, uh, I'd like to congratulate both the superintendent and the business manager for bringing the um, the budget back in compliance with our fund balance policy. That was I know that's been a, a goal over the last several years, and it's, mm -hmm. it's very encouraging to see us back up at fifteen percent. So, yeah, congratulations! Right. We made it back to where we're supposed to be. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so. I was impressed that the two budgets are amazingly close together. I mean, you've explained the main differences and how you can get so close. <laughs> it's pretty amazing, I think, the first time around. Thank you. Any other? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 It passes 5-0. So we move on to item B, gas and diesel bid results. Butch Feely. Yes, so we had uh, we had our bid opening today at two o'clock. Uh, we had only one vendor that uh, submitted a bid form, which was Coleman Oil. Uh, they have uh, given us a rate of 0.13 per gallon uh, over their value added amount, um, and which I believe was very similar to last year's as well. Mm -hmm. So I will move that the Board of Trustees of Moscow School District Number 281 accept the bid from Coleman Oil for gas and diesel fuel for the district bus fleet and vehicles for the period from March 1st, 2023 to February 28th, 2024. I will second it if you change February to 29. Oh. That's the leap year. Oh. Yes. Mm -hmm. Nice okay. catch. <laughs> I will take that somewhere. as a friendly amendment. <laughs> okay. uh, it has been moved and seconded. Further discussion? Yeah. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Passes 5-0. At least I think I heard five eyes. Mm -hmm. I try to hear it. Um, all right, we move on to curriculum adoption, math grades K through 5. Harry Brooks. The content area up for adoption this year is the K-5 elementary mathematics. Numerous math programs were reviewed and Bridges in Mathematics by the Learning Center was selected for adoption by the Adoption Committee comprised of classroom teachers, special education teachers, reading intervention teachers, parents, and administrators. It is recommended that Bridges in Mathematics be adopted. The cost for this adoption is $230,076.60. Do the vendors provide any data on uh, the effectiveness of their curriculum from other districts at all? The committee did a thorough review where they reached out to all kinds of um, different, um, like they, there's a Facebook group, um, they reached out to other teachers that they knew and other districts. Um, we went to, um, I don't remember if this particular one was on edreports.com, but we went to all of those sites that do curricular reviews. Mm -hmm. you, you had a pretty good parent group come in, right? Our parents were amazing. It truly enhanced the whole process. They were fabulous. They asked questions that might not have been asked had parents not been present. Mm -hmm. um, and they were so positive um, and enthusiastic to be on that committee. Our teachers were phenomenal. I didn't know until the defining moment. Like they, the teachers that represented um, Eureka Math, um, Eureka Squared Math, um, that were piloting that, and then there were there, half of the teachers were piloting um, Bridges in Mathematics. They were doing such a great job of teaching it and representing it and sharing information. I thought we were going to be split. Mm -hmm. And then in the end, it was 18-1, and everybody was so excited. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it was, it, it was absolutely, in my mind, it was a perfect adoption. It went really well. Mm -hmm. Good job. Well, I will move that the Board of Trustees of Moscow School District 281 hereby approves the purchase of textbooks and materials for K-5 elementary mathematics. Second. Second. <laughs> I'll let Dulcie second. Thank you. Second. <laughs> it's 
It's been moved and seconded. Further discussion? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, it passes 5 0. And thank you to your committee. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Good job. I mean, that's, the, it's a lot to look at all of these and figure it yeah. out. <laughs> Is this the first time that parents have been incorporated yes. in this sort of process? Yes. What was the inspiration behind that? Well, we have oh, new the, legislation. The, the state law. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we have to do it. <laughs> Not that it's not a, it's a bad thing, but it was yeah, we amazing. Have to do it. I mean, it it, was, it just totally enhanced the whole process. So that's great. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. All right, we move on to item D: release from contract. Uh, Eleonora Miller, Dr. Bailey. Uh, after certificated contracts are signed each year, personnel who ask to be released from their contracts must be approved by the board. Elnora Miller, preschool special education teacher, is requesting to be released from the remainder of her contract for the 20, 20, 22 to 23 school year. I will move that the Board of Trustees of Moscow School District Number 281 approve the request from Elnora Miller to be released from the remainder of her contract for the 2022-2023 school year. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Further discussion? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Passes 5-0. We move on to second reading board policy section for uh, certificated personnel evaluation. Dr. Bailey. Okay. Board policy is reviewed and revised as needed. Board policy section 4, policy 4050-4050.3, uh, Certificate personnel evaluation was revised in June of 2019. Recommending changes that are allowed by the Idaho State Board of Education's rules that will reduce the time required to prepare and complete the evaluation process by both the instructor and the administration. Uh, this will allow more time for providing support for students. Some more revisions have been made since the first reading. This is the second reading of the proposed changes. Uh, uh, the only change you'll see is uh, is at the right here under yeah no that's not it. It's not the purple one? Okay. No. It's uh, at the bottom of the first page uh, where it's put in uh, the Idaho State Standardized Assessment Tools or other approved standardized assessments and, and minimally one assessment uh, one assessment agreed upon by the pers person being evaluated and the person conducting the evaluation. Uh, those, that was the only change I, I did from the previous one. So I had a question about the third paragraph. Uh, in uh, the section, whatever it is, uh, 70, 50, no, 40, 50. Okay. So it, <clears throat> the paragraph that begins certified staff members. Yeah. Um, it didn't seem to read quite right because it says either in their first year in the district and then comma qualify for placement or have an unsatisfactory. So I wasn't sure what the Is either it? part was. Uh, is it? Or, or either, either in their either, first year either, and qualify for residential Either place? in their first year in the district, uh, which qualifies for residential placement on the career yeah. letter, ladder. Well, that's kind of the same thing. Or qualifies for the residential placement on the career ladder or have an unsatisfactory in any of the four domains. So actually there's three options. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh, all right. Yeah. yeah. So you should remove either and say who are in their first year, comma, qualify for or have an unsatisfactory. So just get rid of the either. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. And then <clears throat> what do you think about reducing from two assessments to one assessment? One assessment. That's, that actually would be two because you have a standardized assessment and one other assessment. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Right. Rather than three assessments, which really they only require one assessment, but we felt 
at least get two so that they have a better chance of meeting their because all they have to do is be, meet one of those. I didn't feel comfortable dropping all the way down to one option. Mm -hmm. That gives them two opportunities to be successful. And then I guess the only other thought I had was um, the last sentence of the uh, first paragraph where it talks about how if um, personnel are hired late or there's a long-term illness, then one classroom of observation is acceptable. Um, I might have considered dropping the et cetera and say something like due to an unusual situation such as blah, 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 or late hire. Because otherwise, it, mm -hmm. other, I don't know. I just say, would say unusual situation or uncommon situation, perhaps. So due right. to uncommon situations such yeah. as long-term illness, late year hire, and then one document the in the classroom observation is yeah. Or you could say, just say, in unusual situations, we're certified personnel. <clears throat> start it. <clears throat> start out that way. Um, oh, I see, yeah. So how would you state that? <laughs> well, you're starting it with, in, in situations, you could just say, in unusual situations, we're or exceptional situations where certified personnel are unavailable. Just making that clear that it's and, and not the usual. And drop the due to situations part, because you wouldn't need to say it twice. Right. Oh, right. And, and, and then just and don't even go give right the to such as long. To, don't even give it. I, I think you need you examples. Like example? Uh, yeah, yeah, because yeah. otherwise, what's an unusual situation? Yeah. Okay, what okay. fits, you know. Yeah. So you need some clarification yeah. there. Yeah. Well, they're bouncing back and forth, and I'm okay. not sure where So, I think they're saying part, in, right? <laughs> which word do you yes. want? Unusual no. situations? No. Uncommon situations? I'll let you pick, okay. uh, Mr. Chair. So, one of those where certified personnel are unavailable for two documented classroom observations, such as long-term illness, late year, or, or late year hire, one documented classroom observation is acceptable. So, drop the due to situations and the et cetera. And put an or in. And yeah. put an or between the two things. And then I don't care which you use, unusual or uncommon. I mean, I don't know if it matters that particularly much, but which is if one's better I than the other. I think it was also stated in exceptional. Uh, that would. In exceptional, yeah. In exceptional, yeah. Yeah, whichever word sounds best. I don't know. Somebody else can weigh in on that one. Yeah, I guess it would be an exceptional situation. Yeah, an exceptional situation. Okay, so exceptional. In, in exceptional. exceptional situations. That's the first. Situation where certified person are unavailable for two documented classroom observations. Such as? Such as? Long-term illness or late year hire. One documented classroom observation is acceptable. Because I think we do need to define what at least a couple instances of what we're talking yeah. about. Otherwise, yeah. it's too wide open. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Any others on that? Well, with Jim's good work and uh, amendments, I will... Move that the Board of Trustees of Moscow School District number 281 hereby approves the revisions to the board policy section four. Uh, personnel policy for 4050.00, 4050.3 certificated uh, personnel evaluation as amended. I'll second my good work. <laughs> <laughs> It's been moved and seconded. Further discussion? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Passes 5-0. So we move on to item F, second reading, 2023-2024 school calendar. Dr. Bailey. Okay. Each year, the following year, school district's calendar is developed. Four calendars were given to the administrators to share with their uh, staff 
to gather input. That was the leadership staff. Uh, once that was done, I brought it to you, and then we developed four new ones by taking the, the information that was provided to us. Uh, we updated them, uh, and then we sent those out to the staff as well as put them on our website and got input from uh, community members as well. What we typically look for is what schedules best support student learning, what schedules best support high attendance, what schedule best meets community and staff needs. Uh, we also included one that was a much later uh, start time, and that was to try to beat the heat. That's a concern. Uh, in that, uh, I did... Uh, Basically, when we did the survey, we viewed, I had four comments from uh, parents. Uh, they pretty much had uh, two that selected calendar D, one did A, and one did A and C. Couldn't make, didn't make up their mind. They were just between those two. When I looked at the staff, I looked at uh, a lot of different groupings. I did the whole staff which they selected uh, C as their number one. Uh, certified, just the certified staff uh, selected C. I also did uh, classified staff that uh, they did. Uh, and to, as I broke it down, all, all groups selected C. So I did classified elementary, classified secondary, certified elementary, certified secondary. I was trying to split it up in every direction to see, uh, but they all came up with uh, calendar C. Now calendar C is the one that it would start the first day of school for students would be Tuesday, August 29th. It would be a four, that's a four day week. Following week would be Labor Day, so they'd have another four day week before they had to start five days. Uh, the two uh, professional development days are on, during the year would be on October 5th and 6th. Um, in November, they would have on the second and third, uh, since that's end of first quarter, they would have parent conferences and so forth. Uh, Thanksgiving would be a full week. Uh, Christmas would be different. Um, and Christmas would be start on the Friday of the 22nd would be the first day off. Uh, that following Monday is the 25th Christmas. But they would go until January 5th. I mean, uh, have that, that time off all the way through 5th, so the first day back would be January 8th. Uh, spring break next year would be March 11th, the week of March 11th. And uh, there is a work day on uh, school K-12 teacher work day on January 26th. And also on the 29th is a work day slash uh, professional development analyzing day. Uh, last day of school would be June 5th. Last day for teachers is June 7th. First day of teachers overall was gonna, would be uh, August 22nd. Brand new teachers would come in one day earlier on the 21st. Biggest difference of that versus what we've seen in the other years is the Christmas break. Yeah. Uh, we had people that felt like it might help them with their uh, scheduling of flights and that, that they wouldn't be coming right back after the day of, of uh, New Year's. Uh, also, that they would have the Christmas and the holiday, those those stressful times, and they'd actually have a week of rest after all those holidays and stuff. So, uh, but that's about the biggest, and we'll see how people feel about that. Uh, 
I move that the Board of Trustees of Moscow School District number 281 hereby approves draft calendar C for the 2023-2024 school year as recommended. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Further discussion? Yeah, no, I just want to stress for the record because you're because the, the draft results are a little confusing. It says calendar B was the second choice, but I think as we talked about the way that the survey was done, actually people were split between A and C. A and, a and C had yeah. almost 70 or in excess of 70 votes, and A and C only differ with respect to the timing of the Christmas holiday, and C is right. preferable. So I think it's, I, yeah. Anything else? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Passes 5 0. We move on to item G, the Jewel Lawsuit Partial sell Settlement. Dr. Bailey. Okay, the Moscow School District, along with numerous other school districts in Idaho, as well as other states, uh, sued Jewel Labs for promoting vape used by underage students. The marketing towards school-age children has impacted schools in a negative manner and was un and is unhealthy for our students that we care about. A partial settlement is currently being considered, so school districts are being asked to approve the partial settlement and allow the superintendent to complete all forms needed to receive the funds from the settlement. Additional litigation is still active against the Altera Tria. Altera. Aptera, thank you, and Philip Morris, the parent companies of Jewel, so additional compensation may occur later. And so, yeah, so there will be a settlement, you know, a partial settlement, and it will be divided up among those that mm -hmm. are part of it, which includes Moscow School District, so. On. If you took an average estimate, it would be uh, by how many p people that will be dispersed out of the $600 million that will be dispersed for government uh, agencies such as schools, uh, it would be $400,000. However, we could be lower than that, but and it cost us, I would estimate, it took us four hours to do the work, so maybe $200. Uh, so anything over $200 is going to be in the black. And the other nice thing about the settlement is there, yeah. there are no requirements on how you spend it. Yeah. So one of the things we did have talked about, though, is uh, the vape uh, sensors in bathrooms in the secondary level. Yeah, I thought that was when we originally discussed this. I thought that's it was, what we said that we yeah. liked. To well, no, but I thought the I thought the expected um, payout was going to be towards infrastructure, but that's great that it's not. I the mean, only yeah, thing we, we had talked about was that was a fade out. Right, but but yeah, the the settlement is that you yeah. don't have to you know. Yeah, I mean that's what we wanted to do, and I still yeah. think yeah. we should yeah. do that, yeah. but. You know, we will get uh, fifty percent uh, in August of this, and then after that, twelve point five percent for payments of twelve point five percent every December for the next four years. After that, mm -hmm. and there is a possibility. There's if Jewel doesn't get sued anymore, uh, there's a possibility of an additional eight percent. So just to be clear, there uh, might be much, much larger districts involved in this right. lawsuit. So it would not be reasonable to make any estimate of no. what our portion of the settlement I'm just might be. I'm just giving you an average. Of, yeah, but we could be way below right. that. We, we so have no I, idea. I don't want our public to suddenly think, oh, we're yeah, we suddenly receive this. Yeah. Yeah. All no, right, well, with that. Based off the number of high schools you have as well as mm -hmm. the number of square footage and student body. Right. But so how many districts California are districts are yeah. involved? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, whereas mm -hmm. the board is a plaintiff in a pending multi-district litigation entitled NRE Jewel Labs, Inc., a.k.a. Jewel Litigation, and whereas the board's legal counsel in the Jewel Litigation has appraised the board of a proposed 
partial settlement of the pending litigation, including the general terms and conditions of the proposed settlement, and whereas the board's legal counsel recommends the board approve the proposed partial settlement subject to final legal review and approval, and whereas the board finds it is in the district's interest to proceed with the proposed partial settlement of the Jewel litigation against Jewel Labs, Inc., and its founders, directors, and board members, while understanding that litigation remains ongoing against the additional Altria, I believe, defendants and Philip Morris USA, Inc. in the pending litigation. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Trustees, Moscow School District Number 281, approve the settlement agreement and will take all necessary steps to effectuate the settlement agreement. Further, be it resolved that the Board hereby authorizes its legal counsel to consent to the proposed settlement on behalf of the Board and directs and grants authority to the school superintendent to take all necessary actions, including the signing of all necessary documentation to perfect such settlement. Second. <laughs> it's been moved and seconded. <laughs> Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Passes 5-0. We move on to the consent agenda. I move that the Board of Trustees of Moscow School District number 281 hereby approves all items listed under the consent agenda as presented. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Consent agenda passes 5-0. We move on to our second public comment period of the evening. Public comments is a time to present concerns, issues, and information to the Board of Trustees. The Board hears your comments but does not answer questions or respond at this time, but may ask the superintendent or designee to respond to the issue presented if further action is warranted. Please state your name for the record. Please limit your comments to no more than three minutes. Do we have a public comment? <laughs> Good evening, my name is Mary Ellen Brewick. Um, I wanted to uh, mention that the Lena PAT did send a similar letter to what we sent to you all and the superintendent about our concerns with facilities to our elected officials, including the Senate and the House Education Committees. So we added the additional piece about the bond um, being at 50% and match dollar for dollar and the don't tell me, don't tell me. Uh, there was another one, but I forgot. But it's in my brain. And then um, also wanted to give a shout out to the middle school for their participation in the McCall Outdoor Science School, which is really exciting. We have two weeks there this year, and the science teacher did a great job at the parent information meeting to kind of get parents ready for that. Um, and then I thought I'd give a shout out to the lunch ladies at Lena Whitmore because my daughter really likes the homemade peanut butter sandwiches. <laughs> I asked her if she got the like circle sandwiches. She's like, no, they made homemade peanut butter sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right, then. Meeting adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>